Hi, Felicia. Thank you so much for meeting with us. My name is Jenna. My pronouns are she, her. I am a part of the Studio Museum in Harlem's Teen Leadership Council. And for this episode of Teen Talks, we have the privilege of speaking with you, Quilisha Wood. Thank you. Hey, how's it going? Hi, Quilisha. I'm Jade. My pronouns are she, her. And I just wanted to say that we are really excited to have you here. I think that tapestries are a really interesting form of art. And one of your works in particular that I like were Forever by um, Cardi B. I thought that the art and the layout was really nice and the use of the internet media like Twitter, it really makes it super unique. And yeah, we're all really happy to be speaking with you too. Today, sorry. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cassie and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm really excited to talk with you today. Hi, my name is Jamie. My pronouns are sleep. She's slash her, and I'm so happy that you're here. So just as a little icebreaker, Kalisha, I wanted to ask, if you could learn one new skill, what would it be? That's such a hard question. There's so many things I wanna learn. Um, I'm not a really good swimmer. I never learned how to swim despite uh, living and you know growing up on the Jersey shore and kind of going to the water all the time. I've never been a strong swimmer. Um, so I would really love to learn how to do that. Uh, I don't think I can, but <laughs> it would anything be great to know. Thing, if they put their mind to it, you can do anything you want to do. I, you know, I almost drowned twice. <laughs> So, so for me, I would say like, it's, it's a chore to learn. Um, I haven't tried to swim though in a few years. So maybe now is the time. So I have a question. My question is, could you talk about how you got started in your career and what inspired you? Yeah, of course. Um, I guess my career started with my educational career. Um, so uh, when I was in high school, I ended up deciding to be an artist because I didn't want to take a class that would have required me to have a sleepover in the school's library and uh, do a flash mob during the next pep rally. Um, I'm like an extroverted person, but I don't like to kind of be around people in my private time. And I also don't want like to embarrass myself. So a flash mob was out of the question for me. So I switched out of that course into art um, and started kind of drawing again. I hadn't drawn in many, many years. Um, kind of got back into it and it just changed everything I was doing. I ended up applying to art school, decided not to go um, into the military, um, a lot of things like that. And I went to the Rhode Island School of Design for my undergraduate degree um, in printmaking. And it was then in my late junior year of um, college that I started showing art, uh, which was a bit surprising for me. I think it was something that I decided to do, um, but I didn't know how I was going to do it. And I didn't know what the steps were. Um, I think a lot of people are kind of just like, okay, go to college and then someone there is gonna teach you how to do it. Um, but it really doesn't work out that way. Everyone who's teaching kind of has their own path um, that they were on when they started showing, if they ever showed. Um, and for me, it kind of was just um, Instagram really launched my career, I would say. I was always a big, big fan of posting every single thing I was doing on the internet. Um, and back then, the algorithm for Instagram was so good, and the Explore page really did allow you to see um, new artists and like con content creators you'd never seen before. And one of the first curators that reached out to me um, for my first international show at that time um, was like, I saw your work on Instagram and I thought it was great and I wanted to see if you would do a show. Um, so I would say like that's kind of really where it all started. So that was like 2018. Um, so it feels like it was forever ago, but it was only a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Power of social media, right? The, pow the power of social media. Um, I tell everybody all the time, if you don't have an Instagram account, if you're not posting, you might as well not be doing anything. Um, it's really hard, I think, to, a lot of artists want to be private, and I like, respect that, but I think it's really, really hard when you're just starting out to not be so public facing. 
Um, inspiration wise though, I'm just always inspired by like my family and my community. Um, I grew up in a non art town. Um, there aren't really any artists coming out of my city. Um, there wasn't really anyone for me to like look to as like an inspiration of like, oh, I want to be like this person. Um, so for me, what was really inspiring was thinking about how my family viewed art and how like my um, friends were viewing art and people I grew up with and what, what they connected to and what they found beautiful. Um, and even looking through like family photo archives um, and seeing like, you know, how those photos were shot, um, what made them so special um, and what was in the environment. And I found always so many photos of like, my family hanging rugs on the walls and things like that. And it was kind of like looking back, you know, through that process that like drew me to textiles and the content in of itself was just kind of about making something new that felt authentic to me that didn't feel like it was traumatizing or um, diff like, you know, kind of draining to make, I would say it was just really just like this need um, for work that uplifted kind of rather than struggled. So would you say your family um, is a reason why you chose tapestries as your medium and not something else? Yeah, absolutely. I was making before, um, I originally went to undergrad for illustration, so to draw. Um, and that was what I thought I wanted to do. And everyone was like, oh, you're, you're so good at drawing. This is what you need to make a career off of. Um, but then I went into printmaking and I loved making prints and I loved kind of just like the fastness of it and kind of the origin of printmaking kind of being a way of spreading information. Um, and then my family kind of didn't get what I was doing in printmaking at all. Um, my parents didn't know what printmaking was. When I told them I was switching my major, they were like not happy at first. Um, they kind of were like, what the hell is printmaking? And I was like, oh, it's it could be so many things. And they were like, yeah, okay. So, um, you know, I was like, well, what can they relate to? And I just, there have been times, you know, where in undergrad that I had done some textile projects, like I had done some quilting, I'd done some embroidering and they like loved those things um, a lot more than they had loved anything else. Cause it just made sense to them. Um, and I think textiles and craft in general is so utilitarian and also just has strong family roots. Um, everybody has somebody in their family that was the textile person that was like crocheting or knitting um embroidering all those things and sewing was something I learned from my mother um, at a young age just like how to like do little hand sewing things um embroidering was also something I learned from her and crocheting was a really big talent of my great grandmother's um and kind of I also one time went home and saw my grandmother with a jacquard woven blanket um and it was like all of our baby photos um on the blanket woven and I remember I was like man this is so corny <laughs> But like, which is so, which is so um, funny because of how I ended up there. But I think I was just like, what can I do with this though? You know, like this like everyday kind of like object that is like in our homes, you know, like what is like a different way? Because I was just like, at least when whoever put these photos on here, they could have put them better in a better arrangement, a better composition. You know, I was like, how do you make these like sentimental objects look so much better? Because at this point, you know, I had been in school and I kind of was like critical about a lot of things that I need to be critical about. So kind of just then when I started making um, the body of work that I'm making now and thinking about like, where would it look best? Kind of one day I was just like, it could be woven. Like, why, could, why couldn't it be woven? You know, why wouldn't I use something um, for the opposite intention of what it was created to do? Which is one of my, I think, favorite things to do is using things improperly um, and deciding that that is the proper usage for that thing. So I don't, I'm not like a, for example, I'm not like an instruction reader. I don't read instructions. I kind of just will be like, well, this is how I think it's supposed to come together. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my evolution to working in tapestry specifically. Also, I wanted to say congratulations for being the Studio Museum in Harlem's Artisan Residence for 2021 and 2022. And your W Magazine interview, like that is amazing. W Magazine, that is, wow, like, wow. It was, it was such a shock. Um, and it was just like, yeah, in the midst of doing everything else, I think being in residency, you know, here in New York has been amazing and then there's just been like a lot of fun things I got to do and the interview um, with Alexis Schwartz for W Mag was so fun and so interesting um, and it felt really good honestly I think 
a lot of the interviews I had done up to that point for the most part were kind of short. Um, and I didn't really get to talk like in depth about the art. And I think that was one of the first times that I felt like I was having a real conversation with someone who kind of understood um, what I was going through and kind of like, we, we talked about everything. Um, and I think she did such a beautiful job kind of, of like translating that conversation. But we talked for about three and a half hours um, when it was supposed to be an hour long conversation. So it was, a, it was an amazing feature. Um, so I'm currently taking AP Art History. And one of the things that we learned about is tapestries and textiles from centuries ago. Seeing the incredible change in the art style and technique is so crazy to me. And you know that your work looks like really realistic. So what is the process of making these tapestries, could you say? Yeah, um, I would say it's very different than how tapestries have been like traditionally made. Um, so, you know, you can hand weave, right? Which I think is like the most common method of tapestry we're used to seeing or the type of tapestry we see oftentimes in museums um, are kind of these like old biblical um, weavings that were hand done on a loom. Um, I work um, specifically with um, jacquard and off of a computerized jacquard loom. Um, so that's also why they look so realistic um, because I design all of my images in Photoshop and each pixel that I design in Photoshop represents a stitch kind of um, in the tapestry itself when it's woven. Um, so there are a lot of size specifications that I kind of follow um, once I've kind of created my final image. And then when the image is woven, you have the, um, the warp and the weft, and the warp is the vertical threads that are running, and the weft is the horizontal. Um, and the warp is usually all the black and the white. Um, and the weft is, you know, like your cyan, your red, your um, blue, your yellow, your green, kind of the rest of the primary colors that you need to compose an image. And then every like line by line, essentially, um, this image builds up and the computer takes exactly um, what I design and translates it into a weaving um, in every single detail of it. So if I make a mistake, which I very much often do, um, you can see where that mistake was and it's not really noticeable to other people. Um, and I enjoy the mistakes because it's what makes kind of the whole process human again, you know, um, but every single detail is kind of like woven up and then it's ready. Uh, so it's kind of a, it's kind of a fast process, I would say, on the weaving side, um, because it is done by a machine. Um, but it's it's really it's really pretty, and there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, and since I work with images, there's a lot more color variation that you get versus working with kind of like a solid color. So instead of a solid red, I'm using you know a red shirt or a red dress that has like a million different colors and tones in it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sorry. Um, the internet and being online has really influenced your work. So in your opinion, which online streaming platform is better, Spotify or Apple Music? Personally, I prefer Spotify. I'm a Spotify girl, hands down. Um, I have Apple Music and it's not, it's not for me, it's for like my mom. Honestly, like I have like I paid for Apple Music Family so that she because she didn't know how to set it up on her iPhone. But honestly, I live for my Spotify wrapped every single year. Um, it's the best thing. Uh, sorry, my cat just uh, <laughs> down here. That's fine. She she or he. They're so cute. Oh, uh, her name's your majesty. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, Kalisha, I just wanted to congratulate you because I heard that one of your pieces was acquired by the Met and I loved your piece, especially, um, being a black girl. And I feel like your message had a lot because as women, it's either you're put in one category or the other, either you're promiscuous or you're this chaste saint that cannot be touched. And especially as black women, we're usually put in the first category. And I just loved how in that you are kind of taking control of the narrative and saying, I am being myself in my own comfort body and my sexuality. So can you kind of like 
talk about more go go into depth more about that piece and how it felt having your piece acquired by such a big museum yeah of course um making that piece i think was really intuitive for me because there were so many emotions around it and specifically i was listening to bound to by kanye west when i was making the piece and kind of now that i'm older and kind of thinking a little differently about music and paying attention to things i was like listening to that song and kind of realizing how problematic it is right and kind of this like thing of kanye to turn you know kim kardashian from like kind of like this idea of like a whore to like a madonna and how important that was for him and how essential kind of like this like public rebranding was um and then thinking about like who's allowed to kind of be redeemed in this way and you know who can start off and has to stay right in one category and who kind of gets to shift from one category to the other um and i feel like you know growing up i was always kind of told to kind of you know not be too fast or not be too promiscuous and kind of to dress a certain way, um, behave a certain way, not to, you know, gather unwanted attention um, from men that were like triple my age. And it really um, was off putting. And then also there was this like new layer as I got older, I realized of like fetishization from like white men um, and white people in these spaces. And that translated for me, you know, sexually, but then also translated to me like as a Black artists now making art in these like very like public um, white institutions. And so I think, you know, as an adult, having that piece acquired um, by the Met and kind of like reclaiming my personhood kind of in front of like a larger, very established audience has been um, wild to say the least. And but it's also been like very important. And I think it shifts the politics of spaces like that a lot. Um, when you think about like how Black women are depicted in a lot of the different pieces of art in the Met alone, you know, in museums. I think, you know, as a kid, I'd, I'd go to the Met all the time. I'd go to, you know, the Museum of Fine Art in Philly and I would just kind of be like, oh, ugh. like, you know, I felt kind of grossed out um, by like depictions of what was supposed to be me, you know, or someone who looks like me, kind of not being able to relate to blackness in those spaces as depicted by like some old dead white man. Um, so, it healed my inner child a lot, I think, to have like that acquisition happen. Um, and I recently just brought um, students from my high school to the Met and we kind of had a lecture moment in front of the piece and it felt really like a full circle moment because I was seeing, you know, these like black girls who were like y'all's age, you know, and we're talking about the piece and like I can see like the gears in their mind turning for like all the things they want to do. Um, I think it kind of feels like the type of thing that should have happened years from now in my career. You know, this feels like the type of thing that should have happened when I was like 50 and like I could have like retired after it. <laughs> um, you know, something like so kind of like historical and it's happening now when I'm like 25 and there's like so many more things to do. It feels really, really good and feels really empowering and like important. Um, and I'm just really, really honored and like excited to like have that platform and kind of take up that space. Um, for years and years and years and years to come, like forever, however long the Met is standing as an institution. Um, yeah, I, I can't even like sum up, I feel like all of the really deep feelings I have about it. On the topic on thinking of the future, where do you see your work going in the future? I think the best part is that I don't really know. Um, I think I have, you know, I'm making work all the time and I think it's, it's always a challenge because I think it's just like, well, what's going to happen next? And I think my only hope is just to continue making in the way that I do now, which is kind of like free from outside influences. You know, I'm, I'm in a nice place right now where I don't have a boss and I don't have anyone kind of like directing me in what I should do. And I think all my thoughts feel like they're still my own. And so I'm, you know, I think I'm always just like, well, what is it? What does success look like after you've had a long career? And I, and I'm guessing it's, you know, it's more museums, it's more spaces. But I think for me, you know, my grandest goal outside of like showing and thinking about myself is thinking about the future. You know, um, I want to open, you know, an art mentorship. You know, um, I have two assistants that are, you know, younger and upcoming artists because I want to build those relationships. Um, for you know um artists that are not sure what they're going to do with their career or how to have a career um so for me like kind of building my career means building other careers alongside myself uh so i hope to keep showing 
um, maybe get into some major, major museums. I don't know, have Beyonce call me one time. I think those are like kind of my, my other goals, but it's also to kind of think about what institutions can I form, right? Like I think um, part of, you know, you can only show for so long and kind of be like, well, I'm kind of messing with the institution from the inside, but it's kind of like, okay, beyond that, how do we form our institutions? Um, how do we form new ones and how do we change the rules in our own spaces? So that's what I'm thinking about. Um, speaking of inspiring other artists and helping them in their career in the future, I read that you wanted to you were illustrating children's books. Do you think somewhere along the line you would ever like do that again to inspire the next younger generation? Mm -hmm. I wish. I think my drawing skills are so bad now. I think that the way that I used to draw is so, so different. Um, and I think art school kind of sucked away my love for drawing um, because it's just like the way that you're trained once you get trained on how to draw it's not fun until you get to to like two years later and then you get to do what you want to do um i think i'd be open to if someone wants to illustrate the book about me i'd be interested to sit down and um work for that um but i've been giving i've been giving a lot of lectures to kids recently um, my little cousin, we brought her to the Met and like, I kind of played like tour guide and she was like doing that classic, like, well, why, but why, but why type of thing. And it was, it was so cute and like, so annoying. So I think like my future with kids probably looks a little bit more like that kind of like introducing them to art early, kind of showing them, um, a variety of things so that they know they can like do anything. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was so informative and I had a great time. Um, and I definitely learned a lot about tapestry in the process of this. Do you want to share where people can reach you or to see work in, your work in the future? Yeah, um, everyone should follow me on Instagram. I think that's where I'm at my best. And it's just instagram.com slash Qualisha or just at Qualisha. Um, I'm on Twitter at artgirlq and I have a website that's qualisha.com. Um, in the future, people can see my work uh, in New York. I have a solo show coming up this November. Um, I hope to see so many people there. I hope it goes better than I could ever like imagine it to go. But that's just one thing we have coming up. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye.